Hi, good afternoon. This is Beth from the Center for Contemplative Mind, and welcome to our February webinar. For those of us in New England today, it's just the kind of day we uh, particularly appreciate the virtues of online virtual seminar. The slush and snow is mounting up around us and um, might prevent many of us from attending a, a regular class. So many of you are new participants. Um, so first I want to congratulate you for navigating through the access process successfully. And if you're hearing my voice and seeing um, the first slide in Paul Wapner's Contemplative Environmental Studies presentation, all is well. Um, I just want to introduce those of you who are new to a couple of features of the webinar. Um, you have a control panel up on the top right corner of your screen. Um, maybe you see a, a full control panel or maybe you just see a, a reduced one that has two arrows, double arrows that you can click on that will open it up. Um, you can also use those arrows to close it down while the presentation is happening. But when we open up for questions, you'll want to open that up and then you can see where you, you're able to type in questions or also by clicking on the raise hand icon um, during the question and answer session, we'll try to bring you in using audio. And if you're not using the telephone for receiving the audio, you will need to have a, a VOIP headset uh, to ask questions using that raise hand method. So the presentation will be about 35, 40 minutes long, and we'll have 15 or 20 minutes for questions and comments following. And now I just wanted to say a little bit about Paul Wapner, who will present Pedagogy for Self and Planet. Paul Wapner is Associate Professor and Director of the Global Environmental Politics Program in the School of International Service at American University in Washington, DC. His books are Environmental Activism and World Civic Politics, and Living Through the End of Nature, The Future of American Environmentalism. Paul is also one of the Center's Contemplative Practice Fellows and has been bringing con con contemplation into the classroom for about 12 years, if I figure correctly. He received funding from the Center in 2008 to develop the course, The Practice of Environmentalism, Cultivating and Sustaining Meaningful Environmental Engagement which complements the technical and policy studies by incorporating meditation, yoga, and journaling. We're delighted that Paul will share with us today his pedagogy for self and planet and address some of the questions that arise when we look at environmental challenges from this wider perspective. So thank you, Paul. And now we'll hand over the presentation to you. Well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm not exactly sure where I am. Um, on the planet at this moment, but I know that I'm speaking from Maryland, and I'm really grateful that people have um, have joined. The uh, the topic contemplative environmental studies for today, it's that's what I'll be sort of spending my time on. I thought it'd be useful though first for us just to get a feel for the technology and potentially each other. I thought it'd be nice to do a brief check-in and. If people could type in, let's say, one, possibly two words of, I don't know, how they're feeling this moment, where they're at, uh, that would help us. And so if you could try doing that, and that would give me a sense if the technology is working. Also, if it's a sense if anyone's really out there, or if it's just Beth and I. So take a moment and see if that works. If you open up the little questions um, box on your p control panel, uh -huh. there's a lot of great responses. So we've got happy, relaxed, um, excited to learn, scattered, <laughs> curious great. and enthusiastic, okay. frazzled, busy day, uh -huh. thanking you for the suggestion to, to chime in. Uh, Jean McGregor at Evergreen is delighted to be connected. Laura from Tampa is in the gray and rain. Um, being okay. in Atlanta, uh, Matt Triplett is curious, Doug Chermack is bright and hopeful, Yana Rosales is excited to participate in her first webinar, and Leslie in Vancouver is curious and excited. And Terrific. Okay, that gives us a sense. Uh, gives you a sense. 
gives us a sense of where people are at. Well, thank you for responding. I'm sorry I can't read your, <laughs> your handwriting. Um, well, the, the concept of contemplative environmental studies is really a, um, an attempt to bring together the thoughts of a lot of different people who have been wrestling with um, a set of thoughts. And um, the set of thoughts I'm going to present in terms of a proposition. And the proposition is that, um, that our inner evolution, that is to say our personal growth, may somehow be connected with the well-being of the planet. That is to say that what? That there's, it's a proposition, and the suggestion is that somehow there's a connection there. Many, many people now are starting to feel this in the midst of the environmental crisis and in terms of a sense of personal um, predicament. And there's really two parts to the proposition. One part is that we can come to know ourselves and enlarge our consciousness and live more meaningfully to the degree that we actually address global environmental issues. That is to say that environmental issues provide a, a springboard of sorts to go inside and to deepen our internal lives. The second part of the proposition is that our fellow human beings and other creatures on the planet and the Earth itself may, in fact, be best served when we actually engage in inner work uh, and when we come to the task of environmental protection honed by contemplative practices. So really what the concept of contemplative environmental studies is about is really exploring this proposition. Not saying it's necessarily true, but getting a sense that a lot of people are sort of feeling that this interface is at least interesting and that um, it deserves some exploration, and especially exploration uh, for our students. Um, so. Um, my son just walked in the door, and I told him to walk away. Um, <laughs> how's that for parenting? Um, so let me set the context for the conversation. And um, I'm going to talk uh, about what I call the global problematique. And in many ways, human beings have always had trouble living ecologically sound lives. As far back as ancient Mesopotamia, um, the first farmers on the planet used forms of agriculture, really forms of irrigation, that led to salinization of the soil, and they had to simply move on uh, rather than um, rather than be able to sort of sustain themselves in one specific place. Uh, research suggests that the Romans used forms of metallurgy that uh, led to uh, water pollution. And uh, in Jared Diamond's book, uh, Collapse, he talks about how significant civilizations, in this case the Mayan civilization, uh, faced ecological constraints that they were unable to surmount and that led to many civilizational collapses. Now, it is true that environmental challenges have been with us you know, since day one, as it were. And yet, and yet what I mean by that is that in the past century, really, we have really seen a kind of upgrading of the intensity and scope of environmental issues such that, in many ways, we could say we're in a new world. Um, a combination of massive population growth, uh, tremendous growth in affluence, which means um, our ability to have resources uh, to, to prosper and to be able to buy things where people are getting richer, uh, and technological capacity. But those three factors have really skyrocketed in the last century such that um, it's enabled humanity to be what? a um, I guess you could say an ecological force in our own right. I mean, today we mine the Earth's crust, we fish the Earth's oceans, 
we reroute rivers, fly through the sky, pollute the sky, um, and otherwise really inflict ourselves deeply and extensively um, across the planet. Um, and today, one could suggest then that we are not just tinkering with a specific space, but we are um, experimenting or have become a force which is relevant for the fundamental organic infrastructure that supports life on Earth. Um, ozone depletion, climate change, loss of biological diversity, these are all instances of sort of global infrastructure challenges or global infrastructure problems that our sheer size and intensity have brought about. And now on the uh, screen here, I've put this, it's a famous, the IPAT formula it's called, it suggests that environmental impact is a function of population affluence and technology. And if I had time, I'd show you, and probably most of you know this, that each three of those have gone up um, tremendously. So the question becomes really, how do we, how do we educate students to live in this world? How do we, what skills do they need? And how do we work with them to the degree that um, we provide a meaningful way to engage environmental issues? Now, I teach, um, as was said, I direct something called the Global Environmental Politics Program at American University. And my students want to know, they want to know how to change the world. They want to know how to identify structures of power, how to analyze those structures, and ultimately how to turn the levers of power to create a, um, to create a better situation. And um, I actually think you know, those are tremendous, tremendously important concerns. And most of my research and teaching revolves around those. Um, the move, though, to look at contemplative environmental studies suggests that we can approach this work potentially from what I would say now is the inside. That is to say that contemplative environmental studies assumes that there is an internal and an external dimension to environmental affairs and draws our attention to the internal. It's not to say the external doesn't matter, but it's to say that there's an internal surface, as it were, to environmental issues which is worthy of uh, our, our focus. Um, Okay. Um, now, this contemplative dimension has never been, you know, has always been a part of environmentalism. This quote from John Muir, I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out till sundown. For going out, I found I was really going in. The quote is sort of, uh, what, representative of sort of a long history of environment, uh, in, within environmentalism to suggest that environmental challenges are something deeper than just a matter of fixing the material world. That there is an internal world that is somehow at play with that. Environmental issues, to put it differently, they call into question not just our technological or our economic or our political capabilities, but rather, at some level, even ask fundamental questions of who we are as a species and how we fit into the much broader, more than human world. Contemporary environmental studies, I think, gives somewhat short shrift to this dimension of environmental concern. Um, let me try to do another slide here. Um, it seems to forget this tradition to a certain extent, or it doesn't quite know how to give it full expression. As an aside, I would say that this is somewhat emblematic of higher education in general, which, as the Association for Contemplative Mind in higher education sort of constantly notes, that there seems to be a deprivileging in some ways of student interiority in education, 
um, there's been a strong, what a strong uh, preference for looking at the objective world, suggesting that anything internal is merely subjective, and that lends itself to, in terms of research and investigation and so forth, suggests that um, it, ent it, it allows for bias and um, can, can lead to conclusions which are really um, unbecoming, as it were, of rigorous scholarship and pedagogy. So contemplative environmental studies is sort of an attempt to resuscitate this environmental tradition of uh, a deeper sort of internal dimension. And um, I would just say, uh, just a quick note, I would just note that to the degree that universities came out of monasteries and uh, yeshivas and madrasas and so forth, I think that it's obviously not a very far stretch to engage in this kind of um, exercise. Um, OK. Um, so let me turn to what I would suggest are going to be four benefits, as it were, or four promises of contemplative environmental studies. And these are just, um, I guess, four pieces of reflection on how a move inward can potentially uh, sort of deepen environmental studies in general. Um, and I'm going to call these introspection and consumption, emotions and political projection, instrumentality and political efforts, and uh, finally vocation. And I must say, as I read those now, they're each a mouthful. And they don't seem to ring out or sing out with the elegance that I was hoping, but there we are. Um, OK, so let me talk about the first one, which is going to be introspection and consumption. Um, this is a picture of my uh, freezer, uh, the inside, as it were. Um, so the first, the first kind of promise that a, a, tur a, a turning inward would offer is it would give us and our students a sense of our own participation in global environmental affairs. We all know that being in the north, I don't know if we're all from the north on this telephone call, but uh, most of my students are from the north. And even from when they're from foreign countries, as it were, they're from the north of, the, of those countries. That is to say, they're from the wealthier or more privileged parts of those countries. And we know that northerners, so defined, as it were, um, have a disproportionate impact on the Earth because we have access to um, access to technology and are often more affluent, we can use more resources and produce more waste than our counterparts in the South. And so what we do in some of my classes is we use contemplative practices to sort of go inside and to get a sense of the, um, what, the, the inner stirrings within us that, uh, or the I have here the lore of desire, um, that part of ourselves which, which wants things and that is animated to desire things and so forth. And it's not to say that that's a bad thing, because that's life. And that's part of what being a human being is about. But the move inward gives us a chance to see that and get a sense of its quality. And to a certain extent, then, have some perspective on it so that we're not being instrumentalized by these urges and graspings and attachments and so forth, but to get a sense of just their presence. And when we do that, sometimes we get a sense that they're not about everything going on inside of us. It's a part of us. And so this first part of the four is to suggest that Contemplative practices offer us a chance to go inside, get a sense of our participation in global environmental affairs through, this, through the act of consumption, and see to which way, to, to the degree that we are um, we engage in that, to what degree it's deep in us, to what degree um, we can get 
a handle on it. Um, so that's the first thing, uh, the first of four. Um, the second of emotions and political projection. Um, I teach this class called International Environmental Politics at American University. And um, my students have renamed the course, actually. They've renamed it Introduction to Doom. Because they constantly complain that you know, I go in week after week and I sort of focus on another global environmental issue that seems to be tremendously uh, what challenging. Uh, we talk about the institutions that can respond. And you know, I give these these talks and we have these discussions about just how difficult, truly difficult, it is to get a handle uh, on these problems and to do something meaningful about them. Um, and I would say this just doesn't describe students. Many of us feel a sense of being overwhelmed, a sense of fear, anger, and potentially lots of sadness when we reflect on environmental issues. And we'd be kind of blind if we didn't feel those things. Uh, the great environmentalist Aldo Leopold said, he said, an environmental education is to realize that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And I think he was tapping at the kind of sadness and the kind of uh, profundity, as it were, of uh, recognizing this world we live in. Well, this emotional dimension fear, anger, sadness that many of us feel when we address these issues, it should sound fairly familiar. I think the environmental movement has long peddled in this type of emotion, and rightfully so, again. I think that's how most of us feel. And it can also be used meaningfully to inspire people to, uh, to act. Um, well, contemplative environmental studies sort of, again, it's going to allow us by this interior exploration or this introspection can allow us to, to to get a handle on this potentially. Again, this is all a what this is all a um, exploration of this proposition about our internal and external lives. Um, and what I mean by that is that a, a sort of attending to the interior can allow us to see to what degree these emotions generate thoughts of helplessness and hope and uh, hopelessness when it comes to environmental issues and to to recognize that in ourselves and in our students to what degree do we actually um, transfer such feelings about the world as we teach um, and have students go inside as they sort of register that it also though however, um, allows us to see to what, to the extent that such emotions actually manifest politically in a type of politics of divisiveness, a politics of an us and them. Oftentimes, anger can certainly divide the world. And, um, and certainly, environmental politics are pretty polarized these days. So there's, I would suggest, anyway, that there's a connection there's a connection between how we approach these issues from the inside and their political manifestation. In many ways, one could say that we replicate, um, we replicate collectively what fear and sadness can look like, certainly when people hoard resources out of fear of, uh, of deprivation. Um, and even one could look at the recent climate change negotiations and think about how countries themselves were fearful that other countries would get a better deal or that, um, or that you know, we're not going to move until the United States isn't going to take, take any action until China and India take action and so forth. And one could read into that the same type of emotional expression that, uh, that I'm suggesting. Well, I think that a contemplative studies offers us a chance to kind of break that cycle of manifestation and to, again, as I said earlier, note the emotional 
emotional life that's going on, and not dismiss it, but not get instrumentalized by it. I mean, fear is a terrific emotion. It actually wakes us up to what's important and, and allows us to sort of take actions to be safe. Um, and certainly anger helps us to kind of get clear on what sometimes seems most true in us. But we wouldn't want to be, and we also all know that when we act instrumentalized by those emotions, we often act less skillfully and, um, and not as mindfully and, and ultimately not as effectively as we uh, would otherwise. There's a, in, in class, the way we deal with this is there's a great phrase by the dancer um, Liz Lehrman. She's a dancer and choreographer. Um, and she has this great phrase. She says, turn discomfort into inquiry. Turn discomfort into inquiry. So what we do in class at Boston Times is if we get in touch with this, these sort of emotions that are alive in us, then sometimes we sort of use them as points of investigation rather than things to just um, act or react uh, in, uh, in response to. Um, OK. So that's the third. I'm sorry, that's the second uh, of the four types of promises here. And the third is what I'm going to call beyond instrumentality. Um, and this is about really uh, what? Um, as I said, my students really want to know what to do, how to change the world, and so forth. And, um, and that's obviously an extraordinarily important piece of environmental concern. Um, but a turn inward allows us to get a sense of the dynamics of what action's about. And this third suggestion is that potentially contemplation offers us a chance to act in you know, incredibly committed ways, but not to get hung up on the outcomes of our actions. Um, getting hung up on the, action, on, on the ends, many of us know the environmental movement struggles to win. It doesn't just struggle to play. But to the degree that we get so hung up on the ends, oftentimes then uh, we can be frustrated, we can be burnt out, and so forth. Um, I can just say for myself, I often, what, I often want to know the effects of my labors before undertaking them. That is, I have this sense often that the ends of my actions are the measure of their worth. So I don't want to undertake actions unless I think they're going to be meaningful. Environmentally, this has never stopped me actually from taking small and large actions. I mean, like most of us on the phone, I'm sure. Um, we try to shrink our ecological footprint, and uh, we undertake political action to try to change other people's minds. But I must say, for me personally, oftentimes I do this as a matter of moral gesturing rather than really believing it's going to have an effect. Well, certainly it's going to have an effect, but not the effect on the level of the planet that I sort of you know, um, exaggerate my significance to, uh, to, to be about. Um, contemplative, a contemplative orientation would offer then a different or, or may possibly a deeper meaning to action then, in which would suggest that if we really do give up the fruits of our actions, um, then when I act politically in the service of the environment, I'm not just sowing the seeds of what? Uh, I'm not just sowing the seeds of environmental protection, but arguably I'm engaging in the very essence of environmental protection. That is to say that the environment is not necessarily, or not, not only something that's out there that needs fixing, but the environment's also something in here, that's to say inside myself, that invites me and invites each of us to live as authentically as possible, and to trust that this, in fact, there's a certain extent where this is, in fact, the, again, arguably, the meaning of environmental well-being itself. So um, 
Let me see. I think I have another slide here. So it's as if it is as if there is an inner ecology, or um, excuse me, it's as if an inner ecology is it the heart of outer of the outer ecology that we wish to protect. Um, so finally, the last piece of this is that um, the last piece of this is to suggest that a move inward would also sort of uh, bring our attention to how we engage in environmental change as much as, or potentially more importantly than, what exactly needs to be changed. Um, my students, uh, well, I, I just say my students, again, they want to change the world. Um, and they often, and probably many of us have this experience, they come to us and they say, OK, so what should I do with my life? And uh, should I be an environmental activist? Should I go into politics? Should I become a work for the EPA? Should I work for Greenpeace and so forth? And um, one of the interesting things about seeing our lives as seeing the, our actions simply as meaningful in themselves and not just as instruments toward uh, some other outcome is potentially we could begin to see environmentalism not as a professional vocation or even a social obligation or even a casual concern, but rather we could see it as the work of our lives. How we place our feet on the, really how we place our feet on the earth, the ways we open or close our hearts, the extent of our generosity and our sense of connectedness to the whole of life, we could suggest that these are the essential building blocks of what environmentalism is about, not some simply that I've got a particular job that puts me in the world in a particular way, and that's how I'm an environmentalist. Rather, it's the whole of my life becomes an opportunity to engage. Um, one of the most amazing things I always find, by the way, is that we, my program um, generally does pretty good in getting students jobs in, envir in the environmental field. And this moment, most environmentalists are probably staring at a computer screen uh, in their effort to change environmental conditions rather than otherwise. I'm reminded then in this point about a line that Amory Lovins, the uh, energy guru, said. He said, someone asked him, he says, what's the one thing someone could do to be an environmentalist or should do. And Amory said, he said two words. He said, pay attention. And this move to interiority, I think, allows us practices that allow us to pay attention. And it's that mindfulness that allows us to step into our lives in ways that make it meaningfully ecologically. So for me, um, when I am most deeply mindful, in touch with myself and what is fundamentally important to me, I feel connected to my ancestors and progeny and almost spontaneously work to protect life as a way of honoring my forebears and loving my children. There's a sense, in other words, that such mindfulness can actually be environmentally um, productive in terms of my actions. And I would add that when I'm most deeply mindful I viscerally experience ecological interdependence and almost instinctively treat the more than human world with respect, love, and concern. Now, the problem is, the problem is that I often forget, and we often forget, and mindfulness is a very difficult thing to maintain. Contemplative environmental studies is a move toward trying to um, what? Trying to invite ourselves and invite our students to develop internal techniques, uh, sensibilities, uh, levels of awareness that would enable us to see that our day-to-day -day thoughts um, and movements and so forth uh, 
are not just animations that spill out of us without any consequence, but are actually the means by which we place our signature on our lives and the world. Contemplative environmental studies is an attempt to try to make this a matter of pedagogy, to make it something that is worthy of research, worthy of teaching, um, and worthy of service in the, the broadest sense of that word as it's connected to higher education. So uh, that's that's it. That's where I want. That's that's what I wanted to say in terms of the substance. And um, I want to open it up for questions in just a moment. I have no idea speaking into a telephone to people that I can't see or hear at this moment. If that was way too fast, too slow, whatever. But um, I appreciate you listening. The um, uh, the final piece of this before opening up the questions is just to let you know that this conversation really about contemplative environmental studies is a continuing one. As I said, many people are starting to sense that something is very uh, promising here. Um, and what I've laid out today is just a piece of some thoughts that a lot of people have had. Um, but this is going to continue. And um, one way it's going to continue is that this summer, and this is a picture that you're seeing, a place called Lama Foundation up in northern New Mexico. It's about 1,800, I'm sorry, no, it's uh, 8,500 feet up. Um, we're going to have a summer institute there from August 1st to the 6th. Um, and um, you're all invited. Uh, it's going to be uh, a chance, this is some of the faculty, um, it's a chance to do some practice together and come together as people concerned about environmental issues who want to explore this interface between interior and exterior dimensions of the self and how that can meaningfully be um, meaningfully translated into a meaningful and powerful uh, environmental studies. So thank you very much. And um, at this point in time, I think we can take some questions. And I believe, uh, is that the first question, Beth? Uh, I think, yeah, it is. OK. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say it's, it's sort of it's such a small, OK, there we go. Have your students come back with anecdotes about how contemplative practice has helped them in their own work? Um, that's a great question. Um, well, I should say that I lead, for the past three summers, uh, well, about a year ago, for three summers, I led a group of students up for a three-week summer workshop on contemplative environmental design at the Lama Foundation, where we would build solar-powered um, houses um, with uh, straw bale, adobe construction, and, um, and then we would do some practices. We'd meditate and do meditation and so forth. And um, certainly those students who've had like a real strong, intensive experience, um, they've reported that it's been extremely helpful, if nothing else, to help remind them that they can take seriously their intuitive self in their work. And they, not all of them, to be sure, um, but some of them report that it gives them a kind of a compass in their work which can sort of help them pay attention to what they think is important and also to check in with themselves and so to seek meaningful work um, and not necessarily just whatever job comes. Um, although in this day and age, that's, one shouldn't, I suppose, uh, um, belittle that. Um, so I would say that, yeah, certainly not everybody. And in regular classes when we do this, what I find is that sometimes there's a little bit of embarrassment to bring practices into the classroom. And um, there's always a sense of, I don't know, corniness that one sort of gets a sense of anxiety about. Um, but I actually find that my students, once they kind of get 
with it a little bit, they actually really appreciate it. They appreciate starting a class off with a little bit of mindfulness, and they appreciate ending a class with a little bit of mindfulness. And, um, and then when they go in the workplace, they, some, some of them have reported that they've tried to bring a piece of that with them, with their colleagues and so forth. I think that they have found it as, as tricky as I have. But. So thank you for that question. Let me see if there's another question. Could you talk? Could you talk a little about how you invite students into inner contemplation? Do you invite through guided visualization, specific meditations? Um, yeah, OK, another very good question. I know that the Association for Contemplative Mind and Higher Education has been working on this not just in environmental fields, but in all fields. And I know that there's a, a, almost an archive of information out there on different techniques that different professors use. Um, what I've done, it depends on the course. When I'm teaching just an environmental course, I tend to use actually different techniques um, so that sometimes actually we do some yoga in class just to get ready. We stretch out, and then I make an analogy between flexibility of the body and flexibility of the mind and one's flexibility toward intellectual engagement and uh, environmental issues. Um, sometimes I'll put a poem up and ask students to say, take, take some time and I'll read the poem and then take out a piece of paper and just react to it privately, so a type of journaling. Um, the kind of meditation I do, again, in regular classes, and I say regular classes because I also teach a course, I'll be teaching it in the fall, called contemplation and political change. And that course actually spends a lot of time in, on contemplative practices. And we have a chance to sort of explore different traditions. But in regular classes, um, the kind of meditation I do is usually not visualization, um, but I do walk them through uh, usually a type of vipassana or mindfulness practice where we'll just become aware of first our breath, uh, sound around us, just to become situated in the present moment. So um, I would say sort of nothing stellar in terms of uh, sheer innovation, but, um, but, uh, but certainly, I don't know, seemingly useful. Um, here's another question. At your institution, is contemplative environmental studies welcomed by your colleagues? Hmm. Uh, which colleagues? Uh, it's interesting. I don't know if, you've, if other people have found this, but I find that, um, that many people are attracted to contemplative orientations, um, but feel very comfortable, at least in an academic setting, keeping that as part of their private life. And that there's almost a, a sense if you bring it into the institution or the classroom, you're a bit flaky or, or something like that. I had a very interesting experience, though, just recently. I just got back from something called the International Studies Association annual meeting. And I presented a paper called The Case for Contemplative Environmental Studies. And um, when I did this, I put it out on a couple of listservs to see if anybody wanted to join the panel. And, uh, and we had way too many people. And, we, and from people who you would never guess had interest in this. Um, and I find the same thing within my institution, that um, people, in some ways, if you invite them to, if, if, you sort of st if I sort of step out and kind of say, I think this is important, I find it always interesting that other people kind of join, but, um, but uh, it took some type of invitation. So I wouldn't say that my university or my dean certainly embraces this by any stretch of the imagination. I will say that the two fellowships from the Center for Contemplative Mind helped a lot by providing some legitimacy for these types of courses. Um, but uh, a number of people in my program, Global Environmental Politics, definitely see the value in this. And so um, we continue to push it. Um, I don't think American University is ever going to turn into a school of contemplative studies. but. Um, for now, anyway, under the 
under the major radar screen, it seems healthy enough. And it's certainly not being threatened. Um, here's a question. Um, how does the typical student or individual respond to your invitation if she or he has no formal experience of contemplative practice? Um, yeah, OK, another great question. I think that uh, I think that I mean I, I I have different techniques I guess of sort of introducing people who haven't had any background at all um, and at least even getting them open to the idea of trying it um, and sometimes I say look I got a grant to do this and I'm supposed to do it so here we go and uh, I kind of put it believe it or not on the uh, I justify it by saying there is some money behind this and. People are trying to understand if this really helps in a classroom, and then students open up to this. But I guess the quick answer is that um, I, treat, I try to keep it very simple, and I try to keep it very non-threatening. And often we don't introduce these practices until I don't do it the first day or anything like that. I try to build a sense of safety in the classroom. Um, and for example, one thing I do when we actually do meditate, I have the students turn their chairs out, if we're in a circle, to face outward. Um, a, t a tradition um, that Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist uh, teacher, often uses. And sometimes if people face outward, they feel a little bit more comfortable. So it's just playing with that, that I suppose, that level of comfort, which seems um, important in, in, in any classroom, let alone if it's just contemplative or not. Can you say something about what it means to be instrumentalized by urges or emotions, and how you demonstrate to students that this is problematic? Wow. Um, yeah, well, I think that the general point there is that we're often constructed, or we're often used to reacting to the world and having a sense of reactivity to the world. and. To me, that's a good example of being instrumentalized by um, urges or emotions. That is to say, something triggers something in me, and I just sort of habitually respond in a particular way. The way to demonstrate, the way I demonstrate that that's problematic, it's not to, I don't define it as a problem, per se, but try to create the experience so that a student can get some distance from that reactivity and see that there are other options. And simply developing that, uh, that sense in the Buddhist tradition of witness um, is often freeing to students. And then they find itself, it's interesting, rather than finding it necessarily problematic, it becomes a matter of skillful means um, to feel not instrumentalized, not taken over by one's being triggered but rather um, feeling some perspective, and not necessarily control over, but a sense of appropriateness and uh, enough of a sitting with it to allow them to not just um, act right away. Um, another question. You mentioned that contemplative environmental studies has students consider, consider internal components of environmental affairs in addition to external components. How can we provoke students not only to dwell on external components, carbon emissions, for example, and so forth, but to go into matters of the mind, Cartesian dualism, individualism, instrumental rationality, etc., as well? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think that, for me, the, the way to do that is to demonstrate the connection. That is to say, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in the business of introspection for introspection's sake, per se. There's a lot of other very talented and important people who can help do that. I feel as a faculty member, though, that my responsibility and what I'm kind of jazzed about is to um, make the connection and demonstrate that the internal dimension has this connection and that one won't successfully or as powerfully engage in external affairs uh, without some type of consideration for 
the internal dimension. So it really is a matter of, for me, um, demonstrating the connection and seeing the relevance. Um, and so they see it in what they're reading and what they're writing, as well as in these practices and how they experience them. Hey, um, Paul. It's yeah. Beth. And um, we're, we're getting close to the end of our webinar time, but I see that there is an attendee who has um, the virtual hand raised. And I wonder if we might ah. try to put in um, Les Tile. Um, OK. Do you have a way to, uh, should I, what do I Yeah, do? I'm just going to see if we can unmute him and if he's still there with his question. Les, are you there? He may have had to get go away from the the webinar. Actually, uh -huh. I can see that he he may no longer be available. But I just saw that you there were. You don't think I you don't think I floored him with the power of <laughs> the answer? Well, the the hand was raised, but we might have missed our chance. But there's so many wonderful questions being typed in, and I'm, it's great that you were able to answer so many of them. Um, Thank you so much, Paul. I think we're probably going to have to wrap up and just look forward a bit to the next webinar. I'm so glad that you were able to mention your, um, your summer seminar and show us a little bit about that. It sounds wonderful and intriguing, and I know that that will be um, a popular offering. So there's information about that on our website. And, um, and th we have quite a little series of webinars coming up now um, that you're all invited to be uh, participants in. The next one is on March 24th. Uh, it's called Consciousness in Action. And it's uh, with Rose Saki Milligan and Raul Quinones Rosado, who have an organization called C Integral. And Rose worked here at Contemplative Mind for many years in our social justice program. Um, and she has some wonderful things to offer in higher education now. So thank you, Paul. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. and very refreshing to, to check in on these things and give them some consideration. Um, so we really appreciate it. And we appreciate everybody's uh, attention <laughs> and um, contemplating these, these ideals. And have a wonderful rest of the day. And we hope to see you for the, hear you and see what you type in at the next webinar. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.